Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Navy League Sea, Air and Space Conference and Trade Show outside Washington, D.C. and National Harbor, Maryland. Our coverage here is sponsored by Finn Contieri, Huntington Ingalls Industries, and Leonardo DRS. And we're here in the hall to talk to Stan Bendet, uh, who is one of uh, the expert Russia team at the Center for uh, Naval uh, Analysis. You're also uh, a senior fellow with the American Foreign Policy uh, Council. Uh, so, you know, uh, no third job yet as far as, as, far as we we can tell. Um, you uh, just gave a talk and you, you're obviously focused on Russian uh, artificial intelligence efforts. Uh, and, and the American focus always when it comes to AI is what we're doing or what the Chinese are doing. But not as much focus on what the Russians are doing. And the Russians have always been exceptional theoreticians, great mathematicians, right. very good at computing, very, however. you know, however, you know, certain limitations. But talk to us about what the Russians are doing in terms of AI and how they rank in the global order. So you touched upon a very important point. Russians have always been very strong in theory. So the issue was always translating theory into practice, uh, creating an infrastructure, technical infrastructure, uh, high-tech infrastructure to actually marshal those theoretical um, questions, issues into uh, something that bends metal, uh, into actual results. So what we're seeing right now is the beginning of the birth of a very significant infrastructure uh, kind of public-private, whole of government, that would allow these AI theories to become actionable results. So Ministry of Defense of the Russian Federation has taken the lead right now in marshalling academic resources, military industrial resources. Uh, it is creating forums. It is uh, putting people together to work on developing artificial intelligence. So for example, it's building technology cities where AI will be developed. It is looking at the military departments at various uh, military schools across Russia that work on high-tech aspects like artificial intelligence, unmanned robotics. Um, it is partnering up with the industry. And so the order from above is, look, we have a lot of resources. Let's make sure those resources result in actionable um, technologies and AI. At the same time, Russians recognize that they're actually behind the United States, they're far behind China, they're behind billions of investments by the likes of Google or Baidu. But again, they don't need to invest billions. What they need is to create certain technologies that give Russian military qualitative edge. And for example, Russians are looking at imagery analysis, data analytics, big data analysis, semantic analysis as something that would augment electronic warfare. And uh, as well as um, analysis of various technologies from satellites and radars. So if AI would augment those specific aspects of satellite imagery or electronic warfare, that would give Russia a significant breakthrough in fielding actionable AI in the field. So they have a system called Belina. It's an electronic warfare system, and Russians already touted as AI powered because it's able to analyze various electronic signatures on its own and actually develop results. Um, and uh, we shouldn't forget that Russia's capabilities in electronic warfare uh, are formidable even before the application Correct. of artificial Correct. intelligence to it. Um, talk to us about on the weapon system side. So we just had Vladimir Putin give his State of the Union address. There was a lot uh, there that we had seen before, even if the Russians are making progress on it or maybe not making progress on it. You guys know better on, on that. So give us sort of a sketch on the kinetic aspect, and I'm going to bring it back around on AI and how the Russians look at the application of AI on the kinetic uh, area, because the Russians have actually been a lot more conventional in their thinking about applying AI to weaponry. So talk to us about the weapons portfolio and then the Russian vision of how AI goes into it, where we feel the Chinese would not have any problem applying AI to weapons release. The Russians do have a slightly philosophical difference on that. So based on open sources, we are witnessing uh, certain AI components apply to jet aircraft. Su-35, future MiG-41 fighter will have certain AI components that would allow for better target acquisition and target analysis. Uh, when it comes to more theoretical approaches like unmanned systems, so Russians are testing unmanned underwater systems off the coast of Syria that are able to operate autonomously, analyzing situation, making decisions on their own. Unmanned ground vehicles, certain uh, miniature tanks, if you will, uh, that have AI components uh, that um, are, are taught to operate with soldiers, man on man teaming, and with other unmanned systems as well. Uh, as well as certain missile technology that uh, Russians claim will have AI that would help them avoid um, adversarial uh, countermeasures and better target the adversaries themselves. And what about, bring us up to speed on 
Russian weapon developments, right? I mean, we saw hypersonic uh, missiles, uh, mass fires missiles, although Russia has de demonstrated formidable precision mass fires capability, particularly in Ukraine, uh, where uh, two units, two Ukrainian units were effectively destroyed in, in, in seconds. Um, talk to us a little bit about what the rhetoric is and what the Russian pro actual programs are and progress is in some of these leap ahead capabilities. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of debate within the MOD on the uh, on the future of certain Russian military technologies, but when it comes to practical applications, certainly mass artillery, long range precision strikes, augmented by uh, unmanned systems, is the um, is the picture that emerges within MOD as a uh, sort of forward operating concept. Um, General Gerasimov spoke recently about the way that Russia tends to fight in the future, and um, he he called for Russian military to field precision strike weapons that can strike well beyond the horizon, affect um, adversaries' political and economic components, and all of that would be aided by various unmanned systems in ISR capacity, in kinetic capacity, and other capacities. So certainly they're building on what they already have, they're building on the strengths, but they're utilizing new technologies and they're trying to incorporate these new technologies into existing CONOPS. We are witnessing already how UAVs, for example, help with target acquisition for tanks, for artillery, for ship fires and for other long range weapon strikes. So that's certainly a picture that Russians are going to expand on. Um, and let me ask you one last question. Of all the things that Russia is developing, there's always a tendency in the United States to try to make enemies 10 feet tall, yeah. discounting the formidable, if not insurmountable capabilities that we have. And even though we may not be publicly talking about it, there's been an enormous amount of intellectual work that's been going in for the last decade looking at what adversaries are doing. Right. Uh, even if we have not been uh, as actively pursuing some of these strategies. As you, as, as you and your CNA team look at Russia's capabilities, what are the capabilities that are actually the most worrisome that the Russians are developing that the United States is not addressing and has to do a better job addressing? Well, I, I wouldn't say the United States is not addressing. Like you mentioned, the United States has tremendous amount of resources, especially high-tech advantage, um, that would be difficult for Russians to overcome. But, for example, Russian undersea warfare and submarine warfare has always been very robust. And uh, also today, Russians are trying to um, utilize satellite networks and further develop high-tech elements that they haven't developed before. So again, the issue isn't so much uh, that we're not looking at them, we are looking at them. It's uh, where to uh, concentrate our attention on and what is the most significant uh, for Russia as it forges its own military. Don't forget, Russia is a land power. So its land forces, its strategic forces are always going to take the lead, uh, at least for the near future when it comes to um, combating their own adversaries. So Russians have publicly stated that they are concerned with high-tech opponents to their west, such as NATO. And so Russians are trying to come up with technologies and countermeasures to negate American and NATO high technological advantage. And this is something that we should be looking at. Do you think they've negated any of it or does the West still have a lead on Russia? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be so final in saying that. I think the race, if it is, is still ongoing. But certainly when it comes to electronic warfare, uh, this is an area where Russians have made significant strides um, and the United States should definitely pay attention to that. And let me ask you actually the last question, which when you and I were talking, is a bit, that's how our conversation began actually upstairs, is there's this sense that the, uh, you know, the sanctions that have been imposed on Russia have taken an enormous toll. Uh, there's this sense that the uh, country is, is aging and falling apart and the demographics aren't in favor uh, of Russia. And you and I were talking about it and you were like, this is a completely fundamentally wrong view of, of, uh, of, of the situation. Talk to us about what the real situation empirically that you guys are dealing with in terms of Russia. And, and also, the added question I would ask you is, is anything the West, is the West doing anything that's actually going to defer, deter Putin from doing anything that he's doing? And if not, what does the West need to be doing to deter Putin from a rather risky and adventurous path that even included now a very obvious use of nerve agent as a message to any diaspora Russian community that would decide to criticize Putin and the government? Well, I think when it comes to sanctions, certainly they've had an effect. Certainly, a lot of industries were affected, individuals, wealthy individuals in Russia were affected, but what this has spurred is a very significant domestic substitution drive. 
to try and substitute imported components, high-tech components, economic components, anything from food items to military items, and develop them internally in Russia. And there has been success in that. A again, if, uh, if Russian economy were to collapse, it would have collapsed already. If Russians didn't have their children born every year, then we would have had a, uh, a demographic crisis. We don't have it because Russia as a society is proving surprisingly resilient. Its economy is very diversified, and so sanctions had the unintended effect of kicking some of these industries that were dormant in the rear so that they could actually step up and uh, give the Russian consumer what they were buying um, overseas. Uh, Russians are in import substituting, as they're calling, a lot of military technologies from Ukraine. Uh, they're still dependent on a lot of high-tech items, but they're working on developing that internally. And so going forward, we're going to see less and less reliance on imported Western technology, especially for the military. Now, as far as deterring Putin, I, uh, as, far as, as far as deterring Russian president, I think it's important to understand the intentions of the country. It is important to understand what they mean when they say something and what they do. So we don't have a blanket approach to a country as big and powerful as Russia that we must do X or we must do Y. We must understand what the Russian intentions are and what American approaches could and should be. Um, do you think, uh, you were saying about the sanctions that are targeting the oligarchs, that that would have worked 10 years ago, but not anymore. No, exactly. Um, a decade ago, more than a decade ago, um, oligarchs and the billionaires had a lot more influence in the Russian government. But today, they're still very important for the country, for the economy of Russia. But within the Putin inner circle, we have a, a lot of professional bureaucrats and a lot of professional military people that run things. So it's not just the billionaires who are calling the shots like, a de like, like they were a decade ago. It is a very professional bureaucracy that is actually good at adapting to challenges faced by the country. Sam, thanks very much for joining us. Thank we you. really appreciate it. Thank you.